So welcome to the lesson on packing a set, the final lesson in the music module. Now in the old days of vinyl, you had to pack a set because you couldn't take all of your records with you. You had to put 70 or 80 tunes into one box, or if it was a big night, maybe you took two boxes with you, and that was it. Uh, so we used to have to be very careful about what came with us. Of course, as CDs arrived, we could take more music, but nonetheless, there was always this sense of taking less than you actually had. Of course, nowadays that isn't true, but nonetheless, packing a set is still important uh, for a number of reasons. The first reason is the more preparation you do, the better prepared you're gonna be when you get there. So packing a set forces you to think about what you might or definitely don't wanna play or the kind of tracks in the middle, which is a very good thing to do, a very healthy thing to do for packing your sets. Also, it encourages you to think, what if? What if it's not working? What if they don't like what I'm playing? What am I gonna play instead? Better take some of those. And that thought, again, is, is kind of the night's becoming real in your head before you actually get there. And it's really good preparation for keeping you calm on the night and allowing you to know that you've revised, basically. You've got a plan B, you've got everything thought through. It makes it uh, easier for you to just be 100% sure you've not forgotten anything. If, the, if you're doing a wedding and the bride and groom say, can you play this and this and this, please? Um, and you kind of uh, are checking your set just before you leave the house, well, you're gonna be checking that you did get those tunes. And if you didn't, you can sort it out then rather than scrabbling away, trying to sort it out while you're actually in the middle of your gig. And it um, also allows you to remember tunes you were asked not to play. So if, again, if it's a, an event where, you know, it could be an event where you're not allowed to play tunes with, um, obscenities in them or again it's a you know it's a wedding and the bride and groom say look just please do not play this because it's not our thing again it allows you to just make sure that the tune the master playlist you're going to be playing from that night doesn't contain those tracks by mistake just by default so there's lots of reasons why this is a good thing to do so now let's talk about how to do it now in the old days we used to literally pack records into boxes or crates and take them with us of course in the digital age you don't actually have to leave anything behind so here's the best way of doing it so the principle is to pack about twice the amount of music that you know you're going to need. Now with digital playlists that's very easy because playlists will tell you somewhere on the screen how many tracks are in there and how many hours and minutes worth of music you have there. So the, the basic way of doing this is to start a new playlist and call it tonight's gig or the date or whatever and then start taking tracks from either your master or more usefully uh, your mini sets that you've been working out, your mini playlists and putting them into some kind of order. So you can take two or three mini playlists that are for early on and a few that are for later. Now, it's important to remember this order is not definitive. You're not just gonna play from beginning to end. However, having a rough chunked up order in your set is good because you might roughly find yourself working from top to bottom of the set uh, and that's useful. Uh, so you've got this, this idea of having twice as many tunes because it's over time it's proven to be the sweet spot where you've got enough music to make intelligent decisions as you're going through the night. Should I play this? Should I not play this? Because effectively, if you're packing twice as much new music as you need, you're packing enough music for two completely different DJ sets. So by picking and choosing from each DJ set, you are uh, reacting to what the crowd wants, but there's not so many tunes in this master list that you're gonna be paralyzed. Uh, you know, when you're faced with a huge menu in a, in a restaurant, you're kind of like, oh, there's so much to choose from, I don't know where to start. And it's the same with your music. If you're scrolling through a list of 30,000 tunes at every single gig, it's not fun. So putting the time in to chunk this down into the stuff you think you're most likely to want to play at this gig is a really good way of just relaxing yourself and giving yourself, uh, giving yourself the, the power of just being able to glance, yeah, yeah, I'll play that next. And generally you're gonna be right because of the thought and preparation that's gone into it. So that's the, the reason for, for having twice as many tunes. And constructing a playlist from existing playlists or from your master music library will give you in the end a number at the bottom that says you know you have eight hours of music great it's a four hour dj set i've kind of got there so the uh the important thing to remember here is to not be scared to alter what I've just said depending upon the actual gig. So for instance, if you're playing at a wedding, it's absolutely fine to have two or three playlists. You might have a playlist for the actual ceremony. If you've asked, been asked to do the ceremony music, you might have a playlist throughout the formal part of the event, the wedding breakfast and the speeches and so on, where there's gaps and the photos and you've been asked to provide background music. And then you might have, you might even have two playlists to kind of warm up and a main playlist for the later part of the wedding. You know, we all know that a wedding's the first part of the reception, the dance floor bit. It's generally quite tame the kids are still there the old folk are still there and stuff and then as the evening progresses and more and more people who've been invited only to the evening turn up and so on it turns into a more traditional kind of full dance floor event and you
you might want to separate those two playlists. So don't be scared to do that. In the old days of vinyl, we quite often took two or even three record boxes, an early and mid and a late box. That's fine, uh, and it can be useful for those longer sets, but for shorter sets, it's fine just to do one playlist. So there's a few things to remember here. The first thing is this master playlist is it's a guide. It's, it's there so that you're not falling back on a blank slate every time. You're not paralyzed by all your tunes. So uh, that doesn't mean that you're gonna have to stick into the in this playlist for the whole night, not at all. You might well be, um, well to start with, you can't play everything on the playlist because by definition it's got twice the amount of music in that you need. But also you're gonna be dipping in and out of your pre-planned mini sets because these sets are proven, these sets work, these sets of tracks that over time you've worked out go really well together. So you might, your, your master playlist might take you into some disco and you think, you know, they're really liking this. I'm gonna go into my disco playlist and see if, uh, see if I can just play a few from there that maybe I haven't chosen. And then you might find yourself thinking, oh, you know, after this playlist, I always play the, the classic hip hop one. Let's just do that and see what happens. And then of course, when that stops working, you can go back to your master playlist and carry on where you left off. So you're never gonna play all those tunes and you're never gonna to stick just to that list. You might do, but it's unlikely. It's also unlikely because your experience and your intuition are gonna say, Oh, I forgot, to, I forgot to add this track to this playlist, but that'll work really well now. So you'll start slotting things in as you remember them. Uh, but of course, there's also requests. People are gonna come and ask for stuff. And again, they're not, you know, your job, as, your job planning uh, a master playlist for an event is not to uh, kind of guess all the requests you're gonna get. Of course it isn't. And so you're gonna end up playing some requests that maybe didn't make it onto that master playlist. So think of it as a guide. Think of it as allowing you to prepare for the event by visualizing the event and to tick all the boxes. What was I asked to play? What was I not asked to play? What will I do if things go wrong? Pack about twice the number of tunes you think you're gonna need and don't stick to it religiously. That isn't the point here. The point here is so that when you do think, ah, what am I gonna do next? you can just pop back into your master playlist, see as far as you got, and around that area is more than likely gonna be the kind of tunes that are just right to play at this point in the evening. So that's it. How you do it will depend upon your software and, uh, and all that stuff, just as in the last lesson. That's not the important thing here. The important thing here is to give yourself that hour or two before a gig. And indeed, if you've got one gig in your diary now uh, and you're inexperienced and your gig's a few weeks away, there's nothing wrong with starting that master playlist now, starting to think about that stuff now. Uh, but give yourself that time to do that and it'll mean you're just turning up that little bit more prepared than you would have been otherwise. So this has been a huge module. We've covered everything you're gonna to need to know about the music side of DJing. The next module is equally as far-reaching and important where we're gonna look into equipment and software. So I'll see you over there.